here. They might get more interested. Shark scientists Dr. Mike Heithouse and Sarah Casaretto are about to reveal why sharks seem to attack boats, from fishing trawlers to tiny kayaks. Once Mike casts the line, I'm expecting the moment that fish hits the water for the sharks to be all over it. And as he's reeling that in, we're going to see a lot faster behavior. OK, ready? You're good. Bait's out. That one just bumped me. OK, this one's coming fast. That shark is coming in hot. Pull in that fish, Mike. Ah! It was understood. If you stayed on a boat, you'd avoid a terrifying confrontation with a shark. That's not true anymore. Oh! Oh, oh my God! God. This thing is huge! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Erica Almond was fishing off the Gulf Coast of Florida on a 34-foot boat when a great white shark took interest. No way. Holy moly, he's huge. Great white. Wow. When we first saw the shark as it came closer, we were able to estimate it to probably about 14 to 16 feet. Now, we've all seen jaws, and we know the outcome of that. Great white sharks are rare in the Gulf of Mexico, which made the encounter even more terrifying. As the shark was coming at the motors, if it hit underneath with the prop or on the back itself, you could almost hear the teeth scrape against the metal of the actual motor itself. Fighting the engine. Why is he fighting the motor? I thought, oh my gosh, we're going to need new motors or a paddle to get us out of here because they're going to be gone. Oh, God. Put your hand. We could not believe what we had just encountered and been a part of. I didn't know that that was something that sharks would do. Wow, great white. Erica's encounter is not unique. Many boaters have the same showdown with sharks. Dr. Mike Heithouse and shark biologist Sarah Casaretto are off the Florida coast to investigate why these frightening interactions take place. You go online these days and you see more and more videos of sharks biting boats or just getting uncomfortably close. And the question is, is that just more people with cameras? Or is there something going on with the sharks? And that's something we're out here to investigate. A lot of boating activities involve sensory stimulation that can actually pique sharks' interest. It can involve splashing. A lot of times down the boat, you're fishing, or there's chum in the water. <laughs> and all of those things can attract a shark. So we're heading about three miles off the coast of Palm Beach, where the water depth is about 100 feet. This is an area with a lot of boat activity, and there's been reports of shark interactions. Florida is an incredible place for sharks. One reason is we have so many habitats in such a small area. You've got mangrove forests along the coast, seagrass beds, coral reefs, and deep water that comes close to shore. That means all the different species that are in these areas can kind of mix. So you've got nurse sharks, lemon sharks, bull sharks, tiger sharks, even great whites come through here. They set up shop three and a half miles off the coast to explore why sharks are attracted to boats. In addition to the two biologists, cinematographer Duncan Brake will document the shark's behavior from below the surface. He's filmed sharks all over the world and has had his share of boat shark encounters. One of the craziest interactions I've seen with a shark on a boat was when we were following a bull shark that we'd seen uh, cruising along the coast. Uh, as soon as we approached it, it decided it didn't want us in its space, and it turned around and just went straight for the engine and did three or four bites before it turned around and, and swam away, uh, at which point we decided we were going to back off and leave it be. All good, Duncan? Okay. All right. You're clear. The team's first mission is to reveal why sharks suddenly circle boats. We're here on the spot, but no sharks yet. Any sharks back yet? At the moment, I don't Duncan is in the water with an underwater comms to relay anything he observes. Copy that, Duncan. 
So, Mike, Duncan wants us to start revving that boat engine. See if we can draw some of those lemon sharks in with the sound. OK, sounds good. Sound travels an incredibly long distance underwater. And sharks have amazing hearing. So, you know, if they're not doing something else, that might attract them in. OK, ready to rev. He's clear. Engine's in neutral. Revving. Duncan, uh, looking, and I don't see anything. Do you see anything from your end? Copy that. Crystal clear water, Duncan. The sharks don't have ears like us, but they can still hear incredibly well. They even have special cells on their body that can feel vibrations, whether it's sound or the movement of animals through the water. That boat engine has really equated to, for a lot of the sharks in the area, the ringing of a dinner bell. They hear that and they think, free meal. We got, we got a coming. Give it a rip. OK, I think we got one coming in right here. I spent a lot of hours in the water with lemon sharks. There's one thing for certain, no matter the size, you've got to be on guard. They can spin on a dime. They have amazing maneuverability, being able to turn right around and almost bite their own tail. Lemon sharks are a pretty cool species. You know, get to be 9 or 10 feet long. They're pretty intimidating in size when you're underwater. They're also pretty intelligent sharks. You know, they've been trained to run mazes. And you can see when they're underwater and you're swimming with them, they're really figuring things out. But the other thing about lemon sharks, when you're diving at least with them, no sense of personal space. They just kind of bump straight past you. They're not attacking. They're just going where they go. Yes, we've got two lemon sharks Within minutes, two lemon sharks become a dozen. The only bait in the water, a rumbling engine, and Duncan's scuba bubbles. I don't think I've ever used this term with sharks before. But we're getting completely mugged by this horde of lemon sharks here. The lemon sharks in this area are majority female hanging out. And you never expect to see the little ones out here. While the sharks circle, Dr. Heithouse and Sarah reveal why they believe sharks are biting boats. Watch out! It's a huge boat! Videos of sharks gnawing on hulls abound. Oh my God! Steve Minkema and his buddies Jeff Crilly and Scott Crilly were fishing off the New Jersey shore when a great white decided to show them how its jaws work. Oh my God! <laughs> this thing is huge! This thing is huge! We're all set up, all excited to catch a big fish. I forget who saw it first. Oh, ah! This thing is huge! I remember you saying, holy crap, this thing's big. Massive. Yes. The half the size of the boat. This thing right? comes up on this side. Right for the chum bag here. It just opens his jaw and grabs it. Oh, He's going for the chum. Oh, Ate our chum bag like a, yeah. like you said, like a tic tac. Like a tic tac. Oh, oh, he came right up. He's scraping on the back of the boat. His teeth are grinding into the back. It was chomping like this. Oh, I don't think he could have bit through the hole, but like the size of him and the weight of him, I think if he really wanted to, he could have pushed in and swamped the boat. Jeff, let it go. Once he got what he wanted, he, he just swam away like nothing happened. Dude, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Monster, majestic shark. Yeah, something you'll never forget, right? Now, nah, once in a lifetime. Oh, oh my god, dude! One thing you see in just about every viral video of sharks attacking boats is one of these. It's a chum bag, basically a mesh bag with uh, bait in it. Fishermen use it to attract fish in so they can catch them. We're going to do the same thing, but for sharks, so we can study them. So uh, we're going to put this in here, off the back. Sarah, you can throw yours in now. Hey, Duncan. 
We're about to put the chum bags in the water, so keep an eye out for the shark behavior to possibly change. Yes, sir. We've just put essentially a meal in the water for them, and they're just trying to get that. So we should see lemon sharks coming up, biting the chum bag, and appearing to bite the boat, but in reality, they're just trying to get the fish in the bag. The sound of the boat engine draws in a shark, but it's the scent of the bait that revs them up. Whoa, it pulled it out of my hand. Luckily, it didn't get any bag, but it almost did. So you can see how quick this happens. If you're not expecting sharks around, it could be uh, pretty surprising to have one appear at your chum bag. When we just had the sound of the engine, the sharks were just cruising, they were hanging out, checking to see if anything was coming up. But once we put chum in the water and we put fish in the water, they start going to more of a hunting mode. And that's when their movement gets quick, it gets erratic, and sometimes it can be very unpredictable. This aggressive behavior could mean trouble for Duncan down below. If you see them swarming all around us, it definitely gets the adrenaline going. All we have to do is try to make sure you don't get between them and the food. A chum bag might explain why sharks swarm boats and also why they sink their jaws into them as well. You can see the wave pulled the bag out of the water, the shark missed it, bumped into the boat. That could look like an attack in the right viral video. But what's going on is that the shark's just missing and they have what's called a nictitating membrane. Sharks have this defense to protect their eyes, which is kind of like an eyelid that closes up. Some sharks roll their eyes to the back of their head because the back of their eye is actually a lot thicker and denser. And in that moment, they're blind. So at the last second before it hits the boat, it's kind of losing that sense of vision. And that may be one of the reasons that we see these sharks attacking boats. If what they were going for, let's say a chum bag moves because of a wave or the fisherman pulls it out, they still have the propulsion for it. They're gonna maybe bite the boat and they might just miss. Oh. With so much chum in the water, the researchers question whether sharks are too dependent on bait for food. The team will catch a shark and take a blood sample. With the blood, we're breaking it down into plasma and red blood cells. We're then gonna do what's called an isotope analysis, where we look at the chemical composition of these components to get a sense of what these sharks are feeding on and how much of it might be chum and bait. The team sets up a catch and release. One, two, three. The time the shark is immobilized is kept to a minimum. The way we're trying to catch these sharks is designed to minimize stress to the animal. We're using a relatively small circle hook. That lets us catch the shark right in the side of the jaw, and these sharks heal incredibly quickly. This really shouldn't hurt the shark at all, so they're back to their normal behavior right away. Nice, the shark has it. Right now, one of the sharks have got our hook. We're gonna let it run with it so it tires itself out, and it'll become easier to there we go. pull in. There it goes. Okay. We're gonna pick up the buoys here, gently bring the shark up next to the boat, get it swimming alongside. When the scientists are catching uh, the sharks to tag them and take samples, we've gotta be really careful when we're trying to capture this on film because the shark's attached with a hook to the boat effectively. So if at any point that hook pops, that shark can swing by its tail in almost this 180 degree motion. And if we're in the way, we could get caught in the shark's jaws or also between the shark and the boat. Okay, got it. 252. Awesome. So that's eight feet. What we got here is an eight foot lemon shark. Caudal vein's a little deep because it is a bigger shark. And so Mike right now is drawing blood. And once he's drawn the blood, he's gonna give that vial over to me so that way I can um, break it down to the three components you wanna analyze. The caudal vein is the largest in the tail of a shark. Heads up, heads up. Heads, let it go. Always assume they're gonna do the most dangerous possible thing and you will not be disappointed and you will be safe. Got it? Yep. 
All we're doing now is getting some blood from the caudal vein here. There we go. Good job. That'll do the trick. OK, Sarah. Are you going to stay by the head? I'll come to the head. Yep. There you go. Trade. OK. Got it? Yep. So what I got here is the blood that Mike just drew from the lemon shark. What I'm going to do is first put it in this vial, which will make it easier for me to access with a pipette. When we're taking blood from these lemon sharks, we are able to then do a chemical analysis that helps us determine whether or not the food is coming from just the natural fish in the area or if it's coming from a fisherman's chum bag. With sample in hand, the sharks released. OK, now we're going to get this hook out, and uh, we're going to let her go. Got it. Duncan, you ready for it? I've been in the water for lots of shark releases, and you never quite know how the shark's going to react. OK, I'm on. Don't get anywhere near that mouth. Perfect. This one decided to leave its mark. Oh, no. Look out, look out, look out. No. On the release, the shark was a little bit grumpy. You know, it had been measured. You know, had, the, had its blood taken. You know, it's just like humans going to the doctors. We don't really like it, but it has to get done. It turned around and went straight for the engine. It just took a big bite out the side of the boat. Oh, no. We're good. There we go. I'm a little spree. Nice job. Nicely done. Well, just look at the damage that shark caused on, on the side of the boat here. It just shows how strong the bite force of these lemon sharks are. It's actually ripped part of the gel coat off, a uh, couple of chunks out of the boat, and actually uh, shredded the rubber of the rub rail. Wow. It really proves that, you know, if these sharks really wanted to mess us up when we were in the water, we wouldn't stand a chance. Sharks circling boats and biting hulls while snatching chum bags makes perfect sense. But what about sharks biting boat engines? In the sea battle between sharks and boats. The sharks appear to target one area. Oh, God. The shark was definitely most interested in the motors more than anything. It would come under the water and grab the bottom of the propellers. No way. You could hear a, loud, a large thumping sound and then a scrape as its teeth hit the, hit the motors and props themselves. I thought, either we're going to lose an engine or we're going to have to paddle ourselves home. Oh, God. This isn't a case of missing a chump on a chum bag. These sharks are going out of their way to gnaw on the metal engine and props. We saw that we could get these lemon sharks up to the boat just from the sound of the engine. But there are plenty of videos online of sharks biting engines. And that's not about the sound. There's a lot more going on, especially the creation of electric fields. And sharks have an incredible electroreception sense. It's kind of their superpower. All living things create an electrical charge. A human heartbeat is regulated by electrical charges that signal muscles to contract and release. An EKG reads those charges. Fish also create electrical signals, signals that sharks can detect. These boat engines are sending out these electrical signals, and sharks have what are called ampullae of Lorenzini, which are these little tiny pores around their snout and particularly around their mouth area. These allow them to detect electrical signals in the water, which is super helpful when you're trying to get fish or any sort of animal that's moving in the water. But it can also lead to confusion when you're around man-made objects that also emit electrical signals. It's called electroreceptivity. And some sharks, like the great white, are so adept at it, they can perceive as little as one millionth of a volt in the water. That's a tiny fraction of what a common AA battery generates. Sarah has constructed a test to reveal how effectively sharks can detect electrical charges, like those created by a boat engine. 
What we have here is we have two circuit boards. Both of them are powered by batteries in the Pelican case, and they both emit a current of about 20 milliamps. And once we close the Pelican cases, we actually have these switches on the outside to help us easily turn it off and on and do any alterations we need. What we're gonna do is we're gonna place both of these circuits in the water, but one's gonna be on and the other one's gonna be off. This will enable us to observe the sharks and see how they react and how they respond to the circuit that's emitting an electrical field compared to the one that's not emitting an electrical field. Sarah's test should capture a shark's interest. One last check. The one with the arm up has its power on, right? Yeah, so once they're both in the water, I'm just gonna swim over and I'm gonna put that arm down so that way it's on and running. Okay, but otherwise you've got them exactly identical. The only difference is this one's got current going through it. Absolutely, and the one that is on, I actually already covered the light bulb up so we know that light's not gonna play a factor in the shark's behavior. Awesome, so yeah, this will be a good test to see if they're queuing in on electric fields rather than something floating in the water. For sure. And then we're just gonna tie them off the side of the boat, 20 feet of line each, and see what happens. My expectation is we're gonna have a good number of lemon sharks. This is where they hang out, but we might see bull sharks in Pitta's Florida, so you never know what might show up. The moment they splash in, they're vulnerable to the sharks. A diver's vision is limited by the mask. Lugging a bulky air tank means fleeing to escape is out of the question. You have to always assume that there is the potential for an aggressive encounter, especially when you're diving with sharks. And that's why it's really important to kind of keep your head on a swivel, be aware of your surroundings. It's better to assume the worst and be prepared for it than to be taken off guard. You want to go turn it on? Turn it on. There should be many electrical field now. Company arrives. They're coming in. Okay, we're well, we got plenty of shorts this time. Oh, beautiful. Man, so many sharks are just shot all over the world. The two testers are out. They're about 10 feet apart. A three or four is okay, circling that one on the left that's on. And I have not seen a single shark go and check out the one on the right yet. No sharks anywhere near the other one, but uh, they're starting to come in and have a look at this uh, electrified one. Let's see how this one's heading up for a little right toward it. You see that? That one's a something. I was going back to check it out again. The waterproof battery sending out an electrical field draws a lot of attention. The charges from the battery appear to mimic what a shark's prey creates or a boat engine emits. It would explain why many viral videos show sharks attacking boat propellers.
it was pretty incredible to see that from underwater. And you could see the sharks knew that both of those boards were out there and they checked out both of them, but they spent almost all their time by the electrified one. That's when they would get close, they would bump it, sometimes not so gently. Yeah, I mean, we can even see it right now. They're still swimming past it, they're still checking it out. And what was really neat was also seeing the different type of behaviors. That was incredible, and if you think about how that relates to boat engines, yeah, it probably shows that it is that electric field that they're zeroing in on when they bite the motor. Yeah, and then let alone if there's any other stimuli going on, such as someone fishing off of the boat, that's further attracting the shark and getting them into that foraging mindset. Yeah, well, I would say that uh, that was a successful test. Science reveals why sharks attack boat engines. But what about plastic kayaks and canoes? Many of the most frightening viral videos show sharks attacking kayakers and canoeists. Holy oh my God. God. Oh. Watch out. Woo. Matt Rosenquist, Ben Sassy, and Chris Esther are avid fishermen. They prefer to head out under their own power. I prefer canoes because of the serenity. You know, it's peaceful, it's not noisy with the boat motors. The three friends were about three miles offshore, fishing in the Florida Keys. There were no engines to attract a shark when... Oh, watch out. oh my God! He attacked us. He literally attacked us. When it first started coming up towards the boat, Matt would say, oh, I think it's a nurse shark. And then all of a sudden, I see these massive jaws. You see that? It came straight at the boat hit it with all its force, and it was not happy. Watch out! That was a moment that if we had not had Chris's canoe there, it could have been really, really bad. Oh, I think Ben even fell into Chris's canoe. Oh. That was the confirmation that we were in for the fight of our life. We're both here. Oh my gosh! A bull shark came in charging, just like its namesake. Oh, and I remember the feeling of being kind of tossed, and we're just hanging on for dear life. Oh. Bull sharks have very high testosterone, more than a male African elephant in heat. And this one was proving it. When you're a bull shark with that stocky build, you're one of the few sharks in the ocean that'll eat prey about your own body size instead of much smaller than you. You know, that's a recipe for boat versus shark run-ins. It was intentional. It wasn't a single, like, get away from me. It was over and over. It would attack, and then it would turn back around and attack. Watch out! I didn't realize it, but my butt went in the water for a second. It's really easy to just sit back and enjoy a shark if you're on a 20-foot vessel. But if you're on a small canoe or a kayak, that can be a little more concerning. There's very little separating you from the water, and it wouldn't take much to knock you over. Oh my gosh! <laughs> it was like one part excitement, and then this other part, like, surreal. Is this really happening? Yeah, there are a few things that could attract a shark to a kayak. You know, one would be the silhouette. You know, for a big shark, like a white shark, and that silhouette may mimic uh, what its prey is. For other species, the silhouette may be something worth checking out because maybe there's other prey around some floating object. But then there are other sensory inputs too. You know, the paddle dipping in if a shark's nearby might be worth investigating, not necessarily you know, flying in to attack, but just, hey, something novel in the environment, I'll check that out. A kayak, lemon sharks, and a fishing pole. Allow Mike to reveal why a shark might attack a kayak. All right, Mike, you head on out with the kayak, and I'll keep an eye on you from the sky with the drone, OK? Sounds good. All right. All right, we're sending the drone up. Right now, I'm just keeping an eye on Mike on the kayak using the drone, getting a bird's eye view of things, seeing where the sharks are, where Mike is. Duncan is below for the underwater vantage point. As if on cue, the sharks arrive. A bit of a homebody in the shark world Lemons prefer a home range rather than long migrations. So I'm out here kayaking, and we might see one or two lemon sharks, but I'm not putting a lot of stimulus into the water. Yeah, just a little bit of sound when I put the paddles in, and there's the silhouette, but this silhouette doesn't match the prey of the sharks we see around here. 
Let me know if any sharks are coming. Well, there's one or two who keep uh, swimming past Mike on the kayak. You got one coming under your bow, just swimming past you right now, Mike. Yep. Mike wants to avoid what happened to Ben Chansey off Stewart, Florida. Ben's an experienced paddler who's fished from kayaks for 18 years. He's right underneath of you. Oh my God. Whenever a fish over 300 pounds decides to go crazy and you're in a kayak, there's nothing you can do. We're off the east coast of Florida and we're trying to catch the biggest fish that we've ever caught out of a kayak. We get out there and we catch a bonita for bait and then we drop that bonita down and something huge grabs it. Lo and behold, I realize it's a giant bull shark. I'm like, wow, we've got a bull shark on. This is crazy. It's spinning me around. It's almost like being on a roller coaster ride and I'm getting pulled all around and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. It pulled so hard it felt like it was going to flip me right over out of the kayak and I couldn't hold on to the rod anymore. There was a moment where I was paused and I'm like, oh, I got flipped over. I didn't automatically go, I better get for the boat because I could get eaten. Once I realized that fish was still tied off to my kayak, I'm like, I got to get to the boat. So I swam as fast as I could. I did my best Michael Phelps impression. He might not look like Michael Phelps, but I felt like I swam as fast as him to get back to the boat. He's still on. You might think that these interactions are unprovoked, but when you look at the kayaks and canoes, there's one common thread most of the times, fishing. Watch out. Oh. What we saw already is Shark's not super interested in the kayak, but we're gonna ramp it up a little and test the conditions we see in a lot of those videos by adding some bait. Now, we don't have a hook here. We've tied the fish on and I'm gonna throw it out there. Let's see what happens. Once Mike casts that line and the fish hits the water, I'm expecting the sharks to immediately be drawn to that sound. And as he reels it in, follow it because there is fish blood. That's just a free meal on the end of a line for these sharks. Okay, ready? You're good. Bait's out. We're going to see a lot faster behavior. They're going to be really interested in the kayak and what's the end of that line. Sarah, the bait's out, but I can't see anything. Let me know if I need to reel. Right now, one's passing right underneath you, Mike. Nope, oh, she's coming. OK, this one's coming fast. Pull in that fish, Mike. Ah! Woo! Perfect. So you can see how fast that shark is swimming toward the boat. That's exactly the kind of situation where you could get a shark running into a kayak. Not because it wants to bite the kayak, but because it's interested in the fish on the end of a line. Yeah, that was nice and close. The science behind shark behavior reveals the truth behind most viral videos. But there are some videos where biology or chemistry aren't the cause of boat shark encounters. No way. Sometimes it's personality. Ah! Not the boaters, but the sharks. Carl Torreson was fishing just offshore of Jupiter, Florida, when he came in contact with one ornery bull shark. We started today offshore fishing. We got the word that there was a good cobia bite going on, on the beach. We were about this far offshore. Uh, we found, we came in here. My dad told me, sharks attacking the boat. What's going on? Every time he grabbed the boat, the boat would stop. Then he came back around, and when he hit the side of the boat, it was like a boom. I thought we hit a reef. Bull sharks have a reputation for being a bit more aggressive, a bit bolder, and that's not necessarily untrue. This wasn't about the electricity in the water. This shark was just an angry, angry shark, and we were interrupting his day. He attacked the boat, and he kept attacking the boat with, with intent to kill the boat, kill whatever he was biting. The power that he was grabbing the boat with is unbelievable. That video of the big bull shark attacking the fishing boat is something I'm not used to seeing at all. After he hit, ate the motor and it was biting on the motor, he actually came by and hit the side of the boat, boom! You were literally moving. 
It was like a Universal Studios ride, but it was so surreal that it was a shark doing it and that a shark was that powerful. In our studies of bull sharks, we found that different individuals have you know, different personalities, if you want to call them that. Some are bold, some are shy. You know, not every individual is going to react the same in every situation. You know, maybe these uh, guys came across a big shark that was willing to uh, attack and uh, just decided to go after the boat. I mean, it's hard to tell what the motivation of that shark was, but it certainly was going after the boat. To observe how bull sharks react to anything new entering their space, Sarah and Mike head to a known bull hangout. So in that video, that bull shark is behaving really aggressively, but that sort of behavior is really rare, especially when you're diving. Yeah, you know, these are big predators and they can get aggressive, but usually there's a reason for it. So we're down there. I'm not expecting to see anything like that, but still, We'll stay shoulder to shoulder, keep our eyes on things. I think if there's anything in the area, if we're drifting along the edge there, they'll come up and investigate us. Duncan will film the encounter. Whenever you jump in the water with bull sharks, you've got to have your wits about you. They're incredibly unpredictable shark that's always testing you, coming from all different angles. You pretty much have to have your head on a swivel. In addition to having very high testosterone, Bull sharks are thought to be more dangerous to humans than great whites. Sarah and Mike need to be aware at all times of how many sharks are around and where they are. Bull shark Taylor, you're heading down about 50 feet or more. I'm going to stay on the shark there for a Let's jump down. Roger that. They ease into the bull shark's space. As observed, bull sharks will ram a boat and are known to attack humans. Surrounded by bull sharks, shark researchers Dr. Mike Heithouse and Sarah Casaretto gauge the shark's behavior to determine if they're in danger. Uh, sharks, like some dogs, cats, even humans, like to be left alone sometimes. They don't want company or to be crowded. They don't like to be crowded. If this bull shark was a dog, it would fall or crowd would let us know that dog. The sharks can't do either, so they use their bodies to show us that same attack, like arching their back or lateralized movement. And these sharks are showing us they don't mind us here. And just not seeing any aggressive behavior. And just normal curiosity. No boat parameters on this side. That was incredible. And the amazing thing to me is bull sharks have such a bad reputation for being aggressive. And I mean, there are videos of them spotty slamming boats, but those sharks were just so calm. They were just cruising. I mean, I did not at any point feel worried. There is some personality in there too. I mean, yep. you can see some of the individuals would come in really close, but give plenty of space and others were just hanging out really far in the distance. Yeah, they were enjoying the dive just as much as we were, it seemed. It really shows that you know, these animals are not, as a rule, super aggressive. These are not animals that you would expect to be coming in and just attacking a boat for no reason at all. While the viral videos of shark boat encounters are intense, no one on a boat or kayak was bitten. 
that changed off the coast of Tasmania in Australia. It's a really unique little area, quiet area, not too much drama happens here in Stanley. It's a historic town and there's around 700 people that live here at Stanley full time. It's always been a fishing village. Winter in Tasmania. The water is cold and few venture in for a swim. A shark attack seems like an impossibility. The incident at Standing was an extremely rare occurrence. I've never seen a shark or heard of a shark doing that before. I know that uh, sharks have been sighted off Stanley, but I've never heard of uh, sharks uh, attacking a boat or people uh, at all. Even so, a warning of a large shark in the area was issued when John Arnott and his son Lucas, aged 10, were fishing off the coast. Without warning, a shark grabbed the boy off the boat and dragged him into the water. Within seconds, the father dove in to save his son from the jaws of the attacker. The shark, thought to be a great white, let him go in moments. Many claimed the boy's life jacket and heroic father saved his life. We hear of uh, uh, surfers being taken by great whites, but we've never heard of um, that happening anywhere in Australia. The child was released from the hospital after being treated for wounds on his chest, shoulder and head. Probably everybody was a bit numb for a start because it was just something that you just never hear about in Australia. I've only had a sort of one great white touch the boat. It's more curiosity than anything, and it's very, very unlikely that you'll get grabbed by a shark off a boat. Well, I mean, it can happen, but it's very unlikely. It seemed a line was crossed between shark and human. Being on a boat didn't mean you were safe. The reports of that encounter in Tasmania are like nothing I've ever heard before. A uh, boy was dragged out of a boat while he was fishing, but we just don't know enough about what happened. It's really hard to know what was going on in the shark's head at that time. They were fishing, there was that stimuli, but it's just such a weird occurrence. It's so, I've never heard of something like that happening before with any type of shark. Encounters between sharks and boats will only increase. Fortunately, the truth is these aren't attacks. No way. Just encounters with an animal in its domain. With shark populations all over the world declining, I feel like if you're lucky enough to have a shark attack your boat, you should just lay back and enjoy the moment and look at the animal. You are seeing one of the most well-designed predators on the planet doing its thing. And if you see anything super cool, let me know. The results from the blood sample from the lemon shark are in. It provides a rare insight into shark and boat encounters. When you look at the samples and you look at what these sharks are doing, they're not getting a lot of food. You know, we're not really seeing indications that it's probably completely changing their feeding behavior. Most likely what's going on is that these sharks are in the area and hey, maybe get a little bit of free food here. Why not take a few tail beats and go over there and check it out? Of course, there's more work to do, but the initial indications are certainly that this is not having a major negative effect on the sharks. Whoa, it pulled it out of my hand. Our takeaway from looking at the behavior of these sharks and all the videos is that these sharks are not really trying to attack boats, but they're responding to stimuli like bait, electrical charges. And you're not gonna need a bigger boat 